talk a little about uh, trying to make lazy binding uh, by the dynamic linker a bit more secure. So, plan. Uh, what's the problem that I'm trying to solve here? And uh, what can I do about it? And then some bits about how good the solution actually is. Uh, and then, okay, what are the problems created by the solution? Uh, and then uh, bits about what other options there are and uh, the status of this all. So, review of lazy binding. Uh, lazy binding is it's how the dynamic linker um, lets us defer a bunch of work that it would otherwise have to do. So that when a uh, function call is done uh, to a shared library, the dynamic linker would have to look, has to look up the actual uh, symbol address. Um, this is a way we can say, let's not actually do that work unless we need it by deferring it until the first time the function is called. So the pro, of course, is that uh, you, you don't have to do the effort of the symbol lookup for uh, functions that you don't use. Uh, the con, well, okay, the first is the inconsistent call latency. So the first call is quite a bit slower than all the others. Uh, and then the one that discovered later is that it violates the, the goal of um, uh, write, exclusive, or execute uh, on some of the architectures, uh, the code, uh, or the function pointers involved, they need to be changed on the fly while the code is, you know, while the program is executing. So we're writing to code that, writing to actual executable code in some cases. So that's, that's bad. We, we don't want to do that. And uh, some of you may recognize this slide uh, from Theo's presentation from several years ago describing how the OpenBSD project moved around various things, and here's, we moved to constructors, constructors and destructors over here next to the got in order to make sure that they were not executable or write, and writable, uh, and similar with uh, various p bits and permissions on the got and PLT. So it's like, hey, we did all this great work, and oh, by the way, it's, there's a gap. Oops. So, so uh, goal. We want to make it possible for the dynamic linker to perform lazy binding. Uh, and we don't want a window vulnerability. We want to preferably be a bit more efficient. <coughs> so that's actually on a wall near where I used to live in Emeryville. <laughs> so a little review of dynamic linking here to kind of set the context. Uh, the, the executables, they don't contain the library code that they're, that's uh, in the shared library. They just reference it. Uh, so the executable is small, smaller. Um, and we can even do, you know, nicely update the library without relinking. Uh, and note that the references are by name, I mean, it doesn't remember like a symbol index or something else like, you know, we, we don't say, uh, calling printf doesn't mean calling the 37th, you know, function inside libc. No, it actually, the, the executable knows, well, I'm calling printf. And it's the responsibility of the dynamic linker to say, oh, printf is what you wanted. Okay, let me go look that up over here. Okay, address is, XXX3212, or whatever, you know, whatever, okay. Uh, now, that information of exactly what, uh, you know, where the, what, what addresses are, uh, correspond to what is, are uh, represented by these things called relocations. So, there's these tables of these, and the assembler creates them, and the linker kind of consolidates and rewrites them, uh, talking about how the code and the data depend on uh, these load locations and simple things. So. Um, when you load a, um, an executable, it has to know, okay, these certain things are, are at, uh, you know, these functions may be at a different relative address and it has to convert those to an absolute address. So these are just a couple example relocations. So every platform has its own set, and this is a couple from, uh, obviously, AMD64. Um, so you have the, the first is rewriting a specific area just by adding a value to it. Uh, to the the, off, the the load location, so this like the, at a certain address, we're going to add take the actual address, add a value to it, um, and the other one is okay. Let's just take a symbol value and add something to it. Now, partic particularly relocations, there are actually two types. There's those that have to be done immediately when you actually load a library or when you load a program. So as soon as it's loaded, when either at startup time, when the executable is actually executed, uh, or later if you load it a shared library with DL open, all the immediate relocations, those have to be done right then and there. It has to go through, because this is, these are places where the code actually refers to um, you know, some data location or has a pointer to a function, and it need, there's no way to kind of capture 
act, um, the, the flow control at that moment. I mean, the code just wants it, it wants an address. It, that's all it does. On the other end, there's also the lazy relocations, which are places where it's actually calling a, it's calling a function. Now, when you're calling a function, obviously, you're in the flow of control, so we can trick the flow of control to go over to the dynamic linker instead. And then, once in the dynamic linker, it can figure out the real bits, rewrite the relocation, actually perform the laziness, uh, or stop being so lazy, uh, and then go on to the actual code. And so, uh, with position independent code, uh, we do this to maximize the sharing, and uh, you with uh, executables, you can even do this with executables for position independent executables for those who were in uh, Sean's talk, he talked about it. Um, so, even though the library executable is loaded at a random location, we need to be able to get to the right place. So the relocations handle that. Um, and the, uh, the generated code can't, you don't want to rewrite all these things in the text segments itself, so instead you do some indirecting. And so the, the program, the executable or the shared library, its representation on the disk has these two tables. It's the, the got and the PLT, the got, the global offset table, this stores, it's just addresses and, and values like that in just one big, big table. Uh, well, the PLT is the executable version where this is how, uh, if you do want, want to do a, a lazy binding, the, you, the program actually calls the PLT entry and then that figures out how to go from there. And this gets all very, very architecture specific. And uh, in order to make some of this a little clearer, actually dig in a bit on a couple architectures here. So. So on AMD64 for lazy binding, the PLT has never changed. It's a static chunk of code. It's the, the code that's in the executable is mapped into memory and it doesn't actually have to change. Uh, but what that code does is it actually know, uses the fact that it, we can do these relative lookups and it then says, okay, the PLT entry for printf, for instance, it knows, okay, I, I look over into the got table for the address of printf and from there I can figure out where to jump to. I3D6 is similar, um, except they don't have the, the nice relative uh, instruction pointer uh, relative addressing. Uh, they, you know, the I3D6 designers really should have taken a note from the AMD64 designers. They should have gotten this right. And so. Uh, so the result is that instead, the, um, uh, actually the caller of a PLT, it knows it's gonna be calling a PLT, it actually has to set up uh, the, 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 uh, the GOT pointer for the PLT so that it can all fit inside the PLT. <coughs> so, the even more specific, here's just a, a small chunk of C that if we, if we assume that foo bar and uh, are there are, uh, are actually being pulled from a shared library, the generated assembly looks something like that. So that the that first one, it has this, this annotation here, foo, uh, come on, highlight. That actually is a special bit of code that says, okay, uh, yo assembler, when you actually create the, you know, link or when you create this, uh, the number, we're gonna put a number, actually in, create, turn that into a number, which is the, uh, the got entry for uh, the, the, the function, uh, sorry, the variable foo. So that's, uh, that just loads into the RIX register foo's address in the got, uh, and then we can dereference that in the next instruction. And then the second one demonstrates how calling um, the function in the PLT, it's just you, that annotation to call the PLT. So what the PLT end up doing, this is even getting deeper, um, PLT n here is, uh, we'll say is the, the entry for bar. So it has this nice little thing where it, it does its own look over into the got and ends up loading index and jumps back to the PLT. Uh, and that eventually goes over into the lazy binding code. So the, the got, the, the goal here is that this starts off being an address that actually points into the PL over here to the PLT zero, but we're gonna rewrite it to point to the real printf or to the real bar function. So the lazy binding code, uh, what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, okay, the bar symbol for instance, let's actually resolve it to the correct address. It actually looks through symbol tables, goes off, that's all standard stuff. And then it's gonna update that got entry. 
Uh, okay, but we already said, you may have seen on that, that slide by Theo, that the GOT and the PLT don't normally need to be written by the application code. Uh, so on OpenBSD, after loading, they're both unprotected to read only. So uh, uh, how are we gonna update that GOT entry? Okay, so here's what we really do. We resolve the symbol, okay, then we unprotect the GOT to read write, update the, the GOT entry, uh, and then unprotect it back to read only again. Uh, okay, well, if a signal came in there and we called the function, the signal handler called the function, okay, so that, that's not gonna work either. So let's actually uh, try this again and actually block the signals across this all. So we block all the signals, unprotect, update the entry, un, uh, unprotect it back, and now uh, unblock our signals and actually do the function call. And this works, this is what we're doing. Threads, of course, as usual, come and mess up things even more because threads are a pain. Uh, and so, in a thread program, one more time, more feeling, uh, let's actually also grab a lock there, a spin lock, just so that we can make sure um, that another thread doesn't try to do this at the same time. Because the problem is what happens if you unprotect, if, if one guy unprotects uh, and then another one tries to do the same set of unprotects and unprotects, uh, you'll end up with it in the wrong state. You'll end up leaving it unprotected or you'll, leave, or you'll actually uh, fault trying to do the update. So those, the, the spin lock is actually uh, are registered with a callback so that the thread library tells the, the, the LDSO code, hey, I, yes, you have to use the spin lock here, use it here. Uh, so that you don't actually get the spin lock on non-threaded code. And as a result of all this, if you actually are k-tracing a dynamically linked program, you see lots of noise like this in the, the resulting k-trace, where you see it block the signal, do an unprotect, you don't actually see the, there's no syscall there for the, the actual change, but um, it then uh, reprotects it and, and uh, re unblocks the signals. And then finally, hey, that turns out that was the, uh, the trying to do a resolution for octal. <laughs> now, that unprotect isn't free. Neither of them, for that matter. So, okay, when you add permissions to a page, when it's actually marked read-write, um, we just set some bits and off we go. Um, and then when the kernel, when you actually try to do the write, then the, we'll actually have a fault and actually fix it up and say, oh, okay, yes, you are allowed to write to this page. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, now, on the other hand, when you remove the permission, that has to be instantaneous. Well, that has to be before the return from the unprotect. And um, more importantly, uh, if you have threads, other threads in this process, we need to make sure none of them can, you know, they all are denied right as well for this. So that whenever you do an mprotect in the threaded process um, to remove permissions, you actually have to, you know, send IPIs to all the other CPUs which are also, that are involved in uh, running these threads. Um, and, uh, and that's just, it's, it's not cheap. It gets expensive. And it's kind of annoying because we don't even want those other processes, those other threads, to even see that it was writable to begin with. So we make this change, and then we have to tell, oh, you didn't even see that change. It's, it's a waste. So came up with the idea of kbind. And some of you may remember me glossing a little bit about this under the name mwrite uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the name has changed, and uh, a number of things changed about it. So uh, basically, it's just a syscall for doing these updates, either PLT or GOT. Um, you pass it the address and length of memory to update and a buffer of what you want it to stick in the, 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 that particular memory. Um, and then in the kernel, it has to do the same sort of permission check. So it still does basically the same checks that mprotect would have done and that the copy or write handling would have done. Um, you know, it has to, for instance, uh, you know, make sure that if this page was actually uh, copy and write, it has to you know, clone it and, and resolve that. Um, it has to make sure if, this, if you didn't actually have write access to the underlying page because it was from a read-only file, uh, it'll, it'll break your fingers and things like that. Nicely because it's, by doing as a system call, it becomes uninterruptible, so uh, no, you don't have to do that sig proc mask dance. It doesn't have to kernel, it's kind of implicit there. <laughs> um, nor do we have to do any of the, uh, the, the, the spin lock because uh, we can just say, okay, yo, uh, UVM system and PMAP, make you, we'll make sure that you do the locking sufficiently uh, so that if you have two threads, we're both calling kbind. Um, that nothing goes wrong. So the kind of the before and after, uh, this is basically what the LDSO looks like for um, 
for AMD 64, they, that, the particular uh, resolution part. Uh, and then after, it's uh, a bit smaller. <laughs> Uh, and the result is that it uh, actually is a bit nicer even in the K-trace output. I mean, you just see it passing in enough information and then off it goes. Well, that's the, uh, the kind of the user space side. In the kernel, uh, the kernel we, we, try, we can try to be a bit more efficient about things. Uh, I, one of my early implementations, I actually basically copied the mProtect code path and went from there. Uh, but after some help from uh, our UVM hackers, um, Started just using uh, some, started just wiring in stuff. So it uh, consists of just a few steps. We just copy the data into the kernel. Um, we then force the, the, the UVM fault, fault wire there, uh, takes care of the permission check, the, um, the copy on write resolution, uh, make sure the page is actually in memory in case it got paged out. Um, and then uh, because we, the AMD64 is a direct map where we, there's an address range in the kernel, virtual addresses, which map to all of the physical addresses. So it's a, a, a little subtraction operation that, for the hardware. Uh, we can just grab, figure out the right address in that range, uh, poke the pages, poke that page directly. Um, so actually, it's not actually a B copy because you actually want this to be word-wise atomic uh, from the, the user space side. Uh, and then once that's updated, we can just unwire the page uh, so that it can be paged again and you know, clean everything up. Uh, off we go and return to user space. That's it. We don't have to um, you know, signal other uh, CPUs. The fault, if there was a, a copier on write resolution, the fault, may, the UVM fault may have to do that. Uh, but if we were gonna have to do that, we were gonna have to do that anyway. So uh, no loss there. Uh, Spark 64, uh, as a contrast, uh, is a bit different where the GOT, instead of in, on AMD 64, the, the, the PLT was static and we did everything in the GOT. In six, Spark 64, it's kind of the other way around. So the GOT has never changed. And instead, we're actually gonna update the executed code. Um, the uh, dynamic linker, the, um, we actually update the, there's a number of different code sequences you can use to say, okay, if it's, um, if the, the, the place we're jumping to is within two to the 21st uh, bytes of the PLT entry, then we can use this code sequence. And if it's with close to page, you know, address zero, we can use this sequence and stuff like that. Now, um, there's like literally eight different code paths in the function uh, in, AM, in LDSO. Uh, and I don't think anyone's actually ever gone through and exercised all of them because we're all buggy. <laughs> went through this and discovered that all of the ones that were doing relative calculations were failing to actually correct for the placement of where the, the actual jump was within the PLT entry. So they're all jumping into the middle of the function. <laughs> so which, and, it, and honestly calls into question of whether maybe we should just delete a whole bunch of these code sequences because they're obviously not being used. <laughs> or, the, or that, or our Spark 64s are all crashing in you know, randomly depending on the layout of the libraries, depending on how close they were in the, uh, the, the address space layout. So uh, something to be aware of when you're working on your ASLR stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, in some cases, there was, there was great places where the, 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 the ASM was described as being one way, but actually when you, you actually you know, look at the, the octal value, the hex values, you're like, that isn't what that instruction is. So <laughs> ignore the comments, read the code. <laughs> now the other problem, of course, is that we're changing the running executable code. What happens if another thread does this? You know, calls this at the same time. And you know, the sun wasn't dumb. Uh, they actually came up with a, a set of sequences and, and instruction sets so that you could actually uh, do this update and make sure it was possible to consistently get either the original or the corrected PLT result. Uh, but it does mean you have to actually change it in two steps. So, for instance, uh, similar setup on. Uh, uh, from AD64, the, the, the first couple entries are the, you know, the ones that jump, do the actual jump to the uh, dynamic linker, uh, where PLTN, what it's, uh, so we load the offset to the entry, um, and then we branch, this branches back up to the one that goes then into the dynamic linker. Okay, that's nice and simple. Um, when we uh, uh, update it, what we want it, for instance, if let's say, assume the target address is within two to the 31st bytes or whatever, uh, we'd use this call sequence where we 
uh, save the return address, do the call, and slip the return address back into place. Um, now, if we just did it in the obvious order of writing the, the, the instructions in normal order, um, the first step obviously breaks things. If we wrote that first word, uh, then the, someone, a thread client at the same time would, of course, barf. So what everyone does correctly is you actually do it in the other order. You actually update all the other instructions except for that one. Uh, and then once those are in place, then you can update the first instruction and it switches semantics from jumping into the dynamic linker to instead jump to the resolved address. Now for kbind, that means we actually have to, to give, the kernel has to know how to do that. Now there's a couple of ways we could do this. We could uh, have the kernel just know oh, I'm on a Spark 64 and these are the bytes, therefore I will write them in this order into the memory. No, oh, I don't want to put that in the kernel. No, 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 that's wrong. So instead, I'll pass the kernel two blocks. I'll pass the kernel one block that says, okay, I want you to update these two instructions, and then after that, update this instruction. So, okay, my but, uh, system call, Signature, function signature I gave, I lied. Um, no, I, instead it's something a bit more like this, where, okay, pass pointer to parameter, which actually contains an address, a length, and then some data, and then another address, length, more data. Uh, in the kernel, it's uh, Spark 64, it's, uh, it doesn't have the, the direct PMAP, so uh, instead we, we, we basically force that page to be mapped into the kernel map, uh, then we can poke it directly there, uh, and then unmap it back out of that and detach, uh, clean up everything. So it's, that's actually a little more what the, all the other architects will end up doing. And the, the result of all this is, okay, so how good is this? What, what are the results? And the answer, well, okay, with a make build of the system, um, it uh, saves about 4% on the, the execution time of make build. Um, and most of that is actually in system time. Um, now, how much of that is because our PMAPs could be better and our MP could be better and uh, other things could be better, but <laughs> it's uh, at least removed 4% uh, of bottleneck. Now, um, note that it turns out that almost all the savings uh, actually come during the make install step when we have lots of little short-lived processes where the, the amortized time is there's a lot of PLT resolution relative to the, uh, the total computation time. I mean, GCC does have a lot of entries that it looks at, but it, it, it eats much more time relative to those. So, and the one thing is, there's something not right with my my UVM stuff. Uh, it's not always faster. Um, there are test cases I've got where um, uh, actually running it with the Empertech version actually is faster than the Kbind version. And I mean, obviously, I it I should be definitely possible to to get around that. Uh, and one possibility is just the fact that Kbind doesn't actually trigger any read ahead. So it may be that uh, I just need to make, you know, get the UVM stuff to actually be reading ahead on the PLT and stuff. Whoa, I think, yes, okay, good. <clears throat> so, you know, maybe this system call has some problems. Um, we have a system call that allows you to change read-only memory. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, to quote the wonderful fire sign theater, it's a power that can be used only for good or evil. Um, the, uh, <laughs> gotta wait for that one. <clears throat> so, uh, is there some way we can lock this down? You know, we don't want to just leave the system call hanging out there, which allows anyone to get around and protect. I mean, uh, I, I imagine there's some processes which actually would love to do that, but not all of them are on our, on our side. So, uh, let, can we fix it so it only is capable of being, capable of being used by LDSO, in effect? Um, we specifically don't want this to be a target for a return-oriented program. We, we don't want it possible to return into a call to this and then take advantage of the fact that it has changed, uh, you know, some memory to base effectively be read and executable and uh, often do other stuff. Um, so uh, we've had a number of ideas for how to lock it down. A uh, bunch of checks here. The first rule is that, okay, it should be possible to never have this fail for legitimate reasons. I mean, LDSO should never actually screw up, right? If it screws up, then heck, the process probably should die immediately at that point. Um, so uh, if any of these checks fails, we'll just kill the process. Not even a catchable signal. We'll just uh, call sig exit in the kernel directly. 
So, uh, okay, well, we can lock it so K bind uh, can only be called from one address in user space. Um, we could pass a per process cookie, maybe even a per thread cookie. Uh, we could pass in the old data as well as the new data, and the kernel could compare them. Uh, or maybe we could like lock down exactly what uh, KBind was allowed to touch by marking the pages uh, in some way. So, uh, like we're locking down the PC, um, we can actually just record in the struct process the address uh, from which uh, KBind was called. Um, and you copy that address, you know, that's, that's copied on a fork, zero and exec. Um, and then if uh, that changes, if it, you try to call it from a new address, um, then we kill the process, of course. Uh, and then in, we can even make sure, make it possible for that a, a statically linked program could basically take advantage of this to make sure that a statically linked program would never be able to call this. It would just make one call that says, never let me do this again. Uh, and then the result is we then uh, can do inline ASM in the linker, um, uh, in dynamic linker. Uh, and there we, we get some uh, leverage from some, one of our other security things, the, uh, uh, the stack protector, where uh, if you try to jump into the middle of the DL bind function in LDSO where this is, uh, sure, you might be able to get this, the, the function, this, the, you'd hit the system call, but your stack won't have the right stack protector cookie in it. So cool, you made the call and now you've, you die. <laughs> so we can uh, leverage that to make it a little harder for someone to cause problems. Uh, could also pass a per process cookie, uh, have LDSO in its own um, OpenBSD randomized uh, segment, so it automatically gets filled in and then uh, on the first call we, the kernel remembers that and we just make sure. And we can even then order the, the logic in LDSO so that it first, you know, the DL buying co code first says, okay, let me get the cookie. Now let me do the actual logic of looking up the symbol and figuring out, oh, bar is at this address, printf is over here or whatever. And then I'll call kbind. So I, if someone wants to jump into the middle of the function, they can't get the cookie load logic without also getting the symbol address resolution logic. So they, they kind of have to get both of them together. Uh, but as observed, you know, they, an attacker could probably figure out where that cookie is in LDSO's section of memory. So it's eh, a little unclear on that one, how good it is. Uh, we could also pass a, a per thread cookie uh, and then update it even on each call. Uh, this gets really painful because you have to actually be doing TCB uh, management correctly, the thread control block, which OpenBSD doesn't have right now. Um, so it also, this one is probably going to be, you know, probably going to get, we're probably going to drop this just because it's, it, uh, it's not clear what actual security benefits. I mean, in, it's, uh, I've actually implemented, it's running on my laptop, but uh, um, in the end, uh, it's a pain in the butt and um, uh, if it doesn't actually, you know, if we can't even come up, if we can't come up with a real attack vector that it protects against, then, then it's uh, hand waving. Uh, we could pass the old data, so the kernel can then compare and make sure it's only changing something that looks like a, a, a LDSO, uh, a, a PLT or GOT. Um, but it's the, we're passing the data from LDSO itself, uh, and there's actually a corner case where the binding could actually change, uh, where if uh, one thread went started to resolve a PLT, another thread DL opened another library, and then another thread came in, you could actually have a symbol that needed to change. Um, in the middle of the, the processing. So uh, it would be one really hairy case to actually try to figure out that that's what happened. So uh, it's not worth uh, dealing with that. So uh, and more interesting is the idea of uh, doing the protected mappings. Um, actually this one, uh, I've actually got code to implement part of, of this and we can actually mark the PLT and got so that it can't actually change again. Now this way we'd actually make sure that uh, KBind is the only way that those particular pages in the executable would be changed, you know, and the process could be changed, and that, um, you know, that KBind could only change those pages. So it kind of limits the exact um, uh, scope of this, uh, this dangerous call. And then you can also like make sure that LDSO doesn't get unloaded and stuff like that. So the status of this, okay, it's, no, this is actually a work in progress, unfortunately. The, um, it works. Uh, I've been working on three of our architectures. Um, 
but we're going to want to update to deal, deal with these issues and um, make sure that the, uh, uh, we're not creating too much of a headache for ourselves. Uh, and then kind of we don't want to commit something to just a couple of the architectures until we have a, a, we're pretty sure that it's going to work for all of them. Um, you know, PowerPC, we need to make sure that actually it, we have to switch over its ABI to use the, the secure PLT ABI. Um, we actually need to do that, I think, because of the current one, I don't think it's even thread safe in certain cases. Um, uh, so that's kind of a, a, a looming requirement. Um, and uh, need to tweak exactly how some of the UVM stuff is so we can make sure that it's, it's uh, uh, actually consistently better. But it's, uh, uh, it does close the right to execute. Now the other thing to note is that uh, OpenBSD, we don't actually do some of the things that uh, some of you guys have actually done, I think. Uh, I believe FreeBSD and I think NetBSD as well um, have both done a, a, a pretty good uh, cleanup job on the symbols uh, exported by libc and libpthread and all these um, with the result that uh, there aren't as many PLT entries in libc to start with. I mean, it's, it's, you don't have to you know, go through this whole song and dance on a PLT entry that doesn't exist. So best is to get rid of all those. I and mean, right now, for instance, our MD64 libc, you know, 771 PLT entries, um, almost all for references to other pieces of libc. Um, just on the off chance that someone wants to override printf with their executable, uh, that sounds like more of a bad idea than anything else. So um, it would be better, we think, to, to do the, the cleanup job that you guys have already done and um, uh, get it to the point where there's uh, few or none. Any questions? mic being lit up. So more of a comment than a question. I like that you pointed out um, that it does have security implications. Um, one of the things that you could do, which would cost a whole heck of a lot in performance, mm -hmm. is sort of re-implement the runtime linker inside of the kernel <laughs> and ensure that the new value passed in resolves to, and also pass in the name of the function that you're resolving mm -hmm. um, and have the kernel do a double check that, uh, that have the kernel, you know, uh, uh, crawl through those elf headers and do, do the re uh, reservation. You know, yeah, the, we'd ba it, that basically amount, it, it, it would be implementing most of the, the interesting part of the dynamic linker at that point. Yep. And walking that address space from the kernel would be terrifying um, to do sanely. Uh, it also, uh, it's, that's a huge chunk of code, which uh, I would be a horrible thing to pull into the kernel. And uh, we'd rather try to figure out how to um, make it sane to, to avoid doing that. Um, and maybe some of the, the bits about locking down the pages would keep us from actually having to um, go that far. The uh, uh, note was that, uh, uh, it also, that of course, would also make it much harder to actually make changes to the, the, the dynamic linking process. I mean, there's a number of enhancements to our dynamic linker and um, in uh, uh, functionality and performance that we'd really like to do. And putting into the kernel, I mean, while doing this work, um, once I got a KBind system call in my kernel, uh, I've been switching back and forth between LDSO versions, which with only like two or three cases where I've had to, you know, boot from a CD. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's been much easier to actually test various uh, versions of the, the implementation and uh, to flip back to, okay, let's do a comparison performance-wise. So uh, pretty, I think we would, we'd rather, we would probably throw the whole idea off the bridge instead of putting that linker into the kernel. <laughs> Let me know how you fix that because I would be very much interested. Uh, for the performance testing, did you compare to running with LD by now? Uh, I did not compare to running LD by now. What I did do is I actually did a three-way comparison um, of uh, running without uh, any of the Emprotex at all. So don't don't do the the OpenBSD you know protecting of the GOT. Um, 
Uh, and actually, there was very little difference between um, protecting the GOT and not protecting the GOT. The, the, the memory costs uh, in the, that I was seeing were, uh, the, 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 the performance costs were a fraction of percent in the, you know, which actually told me that I'm, my tests are probably not the exact right tests at that point. Um, but uh, uh, no, doing some more broad tests to say, okay, let's actually pay the cost of doing buy now and, and see what happens uh, would be a, 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 I have a hard time imagining that could ever be faster. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, do need to make a broader comparison of the performance of without any of the, the protections with the protections as they are now in k to, to kind of as a, my performance metric. You had a question? Other questions? I have a probably pretty simple question. When you mentioned that we need to remove uh, exposed symbols in libc, does that mean marking more functions static? So they, or how does this work? How does, why are they exposed? So there's uh, a number of functions internal to parts of libc. For instance, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, underbar, underbar, sbind, fp, or whatever, in for stdio, where you can't just mark it static because it's actually used by functions in other translation units. So instead, you actually, um, you can, at the ELF level, you can say, okay, mark this as, as visibility hidden, and then the linker will actually eliminate it from the, the uh, dynamic symbol table. And if you mark that there's ways, there's, you, you, Ulrich Drepper has this long paper where about optimizing the hell out of all this stuff. How do um, you mark it? Is it like a GCC or something? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes it's a, it's a uh, do you see that visibility hidden kind of thing? And if you do it right, you can actually even eliminate, you can make it efficiently uh, avoid even, you know, um, it will, the, the code can actually say, oh, I, I, even though it's in a different translation unit, uh, it's because it's marked as hidden this time, I can actually just do a relative call even though it's, in theory, could be over it. Any more questions? So, thank you.